Welcome to the Innovation Ecosystem Podcast. We interview remarkable and thought-provoking guests about innovation, leadership, and change in the world of business. Whether you're an executive or an entrepreneur, our objective is to help you and your organization create an entrepreneurial culture, become more innovative, and better able to respond to change. Each week, we'll deconstruct world-class performance from the arenas of business, academia, science, and sports. Each week, you can expect key insights, fresh perspectives, and proven tools you can use straight away to make you more successful professionally and personally. With your host, Mark Bidwell. My guest today is Paul Brody, who's the America's technology sector strategy leader for EY. And he joined EY in 2015 to help lead the firm's fast-growing technology work on topics like blockchain, Internet of Things, and the rise of new innovation models. Before joining EY, he led uh, IBM's Electronics Industry Business Unit. Um, He's also been involved in a number of startups and started his career in McKinsey. Um, So Paul brings a unique perspective on technology based out on the West Coast um, and the impact that technology is having on some of the largest, most entrenched incumbents, industrial incumbents in in, in the world, in, in the global economy today, and how they're responding to some of these changes. Fascinating conversation. Um, three things that I took away. I mean, firstly, his comment that you know he really believes that we're witnessing you know the last stand of some industries that are involved in you know very high stake engineering battles. Um, so you know, great if you're on the winning side, but um, from an observer perspective, it's a fascinating, um, fascinating you know, battle underway. And he comments on that in some detail. Secondly. You know, how the one big insight that led to the creation of Uber and the creation of Airbnb is now being applied to industrial businesses around the world and the implications this has in terms of releasing floods of capacity into the marketplace. And thirdly, what Paul has learned to look for as a sign that an executive team is really committed to innovation. So plenty to um, to learn from here. Before we get going, you know, I invite you to join thousands of other business leaders and access resources that are proven to transform your organization and yourself and make yourself more innovative, more um, more agile, better able to adapt to change. So go to www.innovationecosystem.com and sign up for those resources. And now we get straight into the interview. Hello, this is Mark Bidwell from the Innovation Ecosystem. With me today, I've got Paul Brody, who is the America's technology sector strategy leader for Ernst & Young. Hello, Paul. Hi, Mark. Thanks for having me on. So, Paul, um, good to meet you. We, we met through Guy Spear, and I was looking at your resume, and you know, you, you've you've worked. You started your career in McKinsey, then you worked in several startup startups, um, then IBM, and now, as I say, Ernst and Young. You're based on the West Coast, and I guess you've looked at this sector, at, at, well, at technology for a couple of decades now. H- how would you characterize the impact that technology is having on established businesses today? Uh, it, it's, it's changed so much. You know, when I first joined McKinsey, technology strategy was, or, or just technology was, was one element of many things that kind of drove a company strategy. And at least for me, I always got passionate and excited about it. But what's been amazing over the last 20 years is to see, to see that technology is strategy, right? That if you want to implement change at scale, it has to be done with technology. And that is probably the single biggest transformation is the realization that large enterprises can't scale unless technology is at the heart of their strategy. And so on, on that basis, I mean, what, what are you, I mean, you know, I'm sitting here in Switzerland. Um, I do a lot of work with large, regulated, long product life cycle businesses, um, which, you know, which are wrestling with how, how do they take advantage of of evolution or, or, or innovation or even breakthrough in technology. So I mean, how, how do you think about that when you, when you go to you know, some of your more established clients on behalf of Ernst & Young? I mean, how, how do you get them to recognize that technology suddenly, is, it, well, not suddenly, but is now at the heart of strategy? I think most everyone recognizes that technology is now at the heart of their strategy. The question is how to deal with it. And I think uh, 20 years ago, the answer was, I need my R&D department to do better. Although even then, uh, I had one of my very first clients in Korea told me, he said, I know my R&D department is failing because they report no failures to me. Uh, and, and, and he knew instinctively that the failure to take risks 
was uh, inherent. I think there's more and more recognition that really successful innovation programs embrace all different kinds of ways of, of capturing innovation. And increasingly, it's become acceptable and, and really a best practice for at least some of that to come from acquiring innovation in the market and scaling it up rather than trying to do it all internally. And I think that's been probably one of the biggest changes in how enterprises really approach this strategy in question. And and you touched on with the Korean example, I mean, one of the fundamental challenges that you know, executives in large public companies have, which is how do they, th- how should they think about failure? Because in many respects, failure is is just a a, a word that doesn't, you know, that, that really is not, <laughs> isn't 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 comfortable to use. I mean, how how do you think, um, you know, companies are getting their minds around that now? Because as you say, I mean, without without failure, there is no innovation essentially. Well, and this is to me is one of the hardest things, right? I, I spent many years in in large enterprises, and inside large enterprises. Failure is still kind of a bad thing, right? If you have a really big sales quota and you blow it uh, on a new technology or you make the wrong bet, that is a failure. And there are negative consequences for that. And yet failure in the entrepreneurial sense is quite different. So, you know, I, I failed. I've had years where I worked till December 31st and kind of missed my numbers. And strangely, you know, uh, those were definitely bad failures. Mm-hmm. And when I left IBM, I left IBM in the middle of my time. Uh, there about nine years in, and I started an online movie company. And we crashed and burned. We got sued by every major movie studio, um, which, by the way, is is a sign that you're trying to do something innovative. And uh, we, uh, we, we basically ran out of money. We couldn't afford the lawyers. And my wonderful husband, who is an attorney and warned me that this would happen, has never once turned around and said, I told you so. But what was really amazing was after completely crashing and burning, uh, the, my perceived value in the marketplace was enormous. And uh, IBM hired me back, not just uh, to my old job, but gave me a substantial promotion. And so it's interesting how we can look externally at entrepreneurs and see failure increasingly looks like good thing. It means they tried something. We haven't yet figured, I think large enterprises haven't yet figured out how to apply that mindset internally and think about what is a good failure and and what is a bad failure internally. They're they're just not as good as that at that yet. Yeah, because I mean, there is a big difference between an entrepreneur that fails. I mean, particularly in North America, it's slightly different here in Europe. But I mean, that's a a sign of progress. It's a sign of growth. It's actually almost like, um, you know, it's a a check on the box for an investor, because, you know, if you if you haven't failed, you haven't been trying hard enough. But for for an organization to crash and burn with shareholders, that's a completely different story. I mean, what do you see any um, I mean, any examples of companies that are that are putting in place programs to um, or, or trying to change a culture around failure to encourage more experimentation? I mean, I've I've heard, for instance, you know, investors talk about um, you know that they invest, uh, you know, venture capitalists, you know, cor- corporate VCs are investing. They have a learning returns as well as financial returns from their investments, which is beginning to get to the idea of of um, of failure as as something that they're looking to um, to take advantage of, if you like. But I mean, how, how are larger organizations thinking about this from a, from a culture or from a, from a leadership behavior perspective? Any, any insight on that, Paul? Uh, so lots of lip service, very little action. Uh, you know, everybody says we, we want to fail quickly, we want to fail fast, uh, but there, there's not a lot of sort of, not just forgiveness, but, but celebration of failure for the most part. I think uh, there's two issues. One is cultural, right? It's, it's great to say failure is good. But the other, I think, is that it's, it's, somewhat, um, it's somewhat contradictory to corporate cultures that want to, uh, uh, are always looking for, for layoffs or opportunities to cut costs. I think people are most comfortable taking risks in an environment where they feel like their colleagues will do the right thing. I'm not expecting to get a bonus or a raise if I take a risk and I fail, but I'd like to be relatively comfortable that my colleagues will do the right thing and I, I won't be fired, right? Or I won't be at top of the list in the next round of layoffs. And so I think it's a, a, a culture of commitment to people that helps people feel confident to take failures. Because I, I do think if you look at if you look at the demographics of entrepreneurs, right, and we see this all the time in Silicon Valley, they are remarkably consistently from privileged backgrounds. And 
I, I think if, if I were to isolate it, it's that, it's that these people feel most comfortable taking risks because they know they have family to fall back on. They know that, you know, given their education and their background, that, you know, they'll be able to pick themselves up and find another job. They're not, the consequences for failure are just not that terrible. And uh, they're not going to get a medal, but it's not going to be the end of the world. And I think we have to create environments in enterprises where people feel like, you know, I'm not going to be at the top of the list at the next round of layoffs. And fortunately, in large enterprises that are overly focused on short-term financial results, it's hard to avoid uh, uh, thinking a lot about how do I stay off that list. Yeah. But of course, your experience, which is an interesting one, is, you know, having gone out of large corporate America, setting up your own business, it not going the way you wanted it, you, you know, um, and then going back it. So using that experience and, and your employers, your previous employers recognizing the value of that experience and bringing you back in and doing something you know, even more significant. I mean, which is a which, that's a very rare journey, I suspect. Or, or have you are you you know, do you do people in your network uh, relate to that story because they've had that experience as well? It might be a rare journey generally and globally, but it's astonishingly common in the U.S., especially in Silicon Valley. There's a lot of movement in and out of large enterprises, back and forth to technology companies, uh, and and people. You know, it's it's very common to to see somebody say, "Oh, you know, I'm." A, they call them here at EY. They call them boomerangs, right? <laughs> oh, I left. I joined this startup. It didn't work yeah. out. I came back. Yeah, it's right? like the B to B, the B to business to business, back to banking. But that was the old one in the '90s, wasn't it? Yeah, exactly. Right. And, and I think uh, it's, it's, it's common and it's accepted and people are like, that's really great that you, you tried that. Yeah, absolutely. So, so let's get into what you're doing now at EY because, EY, because clearly there's a lot of, you know, you're right at the heart of, um, of, you know, some pretty seismic shifts going on in, in industry based on the West Coast. Um, what's, you know, what's the data saying about how these large companies are actually dealing with um, these disruptive technologies? Any, any insights from your perspective? Well, this is the most challenging thing about the data, right? And we, you, we get up and all the time and talk about how disruption is coming and it's going to transform our industries. If you sit down and look at the data and the economist, but the economist and Goldman Sachs have done some very nice research. The truth is large enterprises are doing a really good job of fending off disruption, right? Industries are consolidating. Um, if you look, for example, at the uh, average lifespan of a company in the S&P 500, people often say that's evidence of more competition. Actually, it turns out when you peel back the numbers, uh, a lot of the decrease in the lifespan of companies in the S&P 500 is industry consolidation. Uh, M&A uh, uh, is in many years more than 50% of the, uh, of the reasons for exit in the S&P 500 is the company was acquired. Mm -hmm. And The Economist just did a good study industries are getting more concentrated. And then, of course, profits as a percentage of GDP are at their highest level, I think, since the roaring 20s. So in this time of tremendous technological transformation, old school consolidation is driving the business. However, there is a possibility, and I, I think this is real, this is, the, um, this is kind of the last stand of some industries that are on the brink of disruption. Uh, a very substantial disruption. I can't see any way for the automotive industry, for example, to avoid a colossal transformation that will come with the advent of self-driving cars. And I, I like to think of that particular case as literally the highest stakes engineering battle in history when you think about the, the size of the automotive industry and the number of jobs and the amount of trade that, that depend on it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and I mean, what are the met what are the metrics around that industry? I mean, I remember it post two thousand and eight. The, the statistics were pretty significant. What what you know? What what's the how how relevant is it for the U.S. economy at the moment from an employment point of view or a GDP point of view? Off the top of my head, I, I couldn't say. Right, my recollection also is you know came to mind around the time of the the, the government bailout for for General Motors that it's millions of jobs. Mm -hmm. And the, the metric that sticks more in my mind and the one that's a big red flag is. Average utilization, active utilization of an automobile every day, it's 4%. Yep, yep. Right? That is, you know, if you think about it, right, it's the second most valuable asset that we own, and we use it for 4% of the day. And what that tells us is this is a perfect candidate for a shift from a, a fixed ownership model to a shared ownership model. Mm -hmm. uh, and the problem is 
it's very inconvenient. We do it if it was uh, convenient, but it isn't, especially if you don't live in a dense urban area. Self-driving vehicles make that possible, right? You, uh, once you can share that vehicle, the uh, possibilities are, are very substantial. And if you look at the benchmark, what is the maximum reasonable utilization? Um, I would argue that the, the, at least the best benchmark that we have right now is New York City, where you have what I think of as the densest, most liquid market for taxis in the world. And according to the New York Taxi and Limousine Commission, the average New York taxi cab is utilized 50% of the time. So that is, that's about 10x mm. the average utilization of an automobile. So you, you do the math on kind of the number of cars that we need. It represents a, no matter who wins this race to create these, these products, the likely transformation is going to be colossal. Yeah, yeah, and that one insight was the one, the insight that created Uber, which is around you know maximizing or optimizing the um, the asset turns, if you like. Which is and we heard this with Amazon when they were created way back when, right? I mean, they, they, you know, them versus Barnes and Noble, the number of asset turns they had in a year versus Barnes and Noble was, you know, I can't remember 10, 15 times of their their warehouses. So it's a similar concept. What 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 else beyond um, beyond self driving car or beyond the automobile? What industry? What other industries would you be? I won't say shorting, but certainly looking at, looking quite circumspectly at in terms of uh, making sure your 401k wasn't too heavily invested in them, for instance. Yeah, that, that's a really hard one to figure out. But in general, where I've been looking is what will happen to industries as the Internet of Things takes hold? And mm -hmm. I think that um, uh, there are... Uh, kind of two types of process trans two types of transformation that we can expect to see. One is around asset utilization and the other is around business process cycle times. So on the asset utilization side, we if you go talk to companies about IoT, they talk a lot about how to keep things up running 24/7. They're actually relatively few assets. They're few, they're valuable, jet engines, oil platforms. They need to the focus of IoT for them is uptime. But what's more interesting is if you look in the economy as a whole, we are up to our eyeballs in idle assets, right? It's not just cars, but for example, we looked at uh, MRI machines in, in mm -hmm. North America. The average MRI machine in North America is utilized about 25% of the day, right? Uh, so, you know, even if you weren't running these things flat out, that's a multi-million dollar piece of capital equipment that's sitting in a hospital that's idle 75% of the time. Uh, and over and over again, like trucks, the average uh, one out of every five trucks in North America on the road is empty, entirely <laughs> empty. Extraordinary. And the other four are only 70% full. What IoT does is with the Internet of Things, we can start to instrument assets and we can start to know that, right? There was that old joke about 50% of my advertising is wasted. Well, the truth is in the global economy, 50% of our capacity and assets are wasted. The problem is we don't know what's available or where it is. And even if we did, historically, the cost of the transaction, the managing of that availability was too high to be worth it. With the Internet of Things, we can know what's available, we can know where it's available, and we can fully automate the process of booking it, of reserving it, and, and, and making it available. And so I believe we're going to see across many, many industries floods of capacity uh, being driven into the market through asset utilization. So, I mean, which has an impact on, on price of the, the assets, but I mean, it also, I guess, means that if you're if you're running these assets today and don't get, you know, with the program and, and leverage these new technologies, then you're going to be out of business pretty quickly. Yes, exactly. So that's one, which is asset utilization. The other one is cycle time compression. And the analogy I use is this. Go to a factory. Go to the Tesla factory. Go to a Ford factory. They'll make a $50,000 car start to finish. You know, stuff goes in the, the, the front of the factory and comes out the back in like 40, 50 or 60 hours, right? That's a lot of value added in a relatively short period of time. If you want to renovate your bathroom, you can spend less money in about five months, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and you've had this experience, right? The contractor shows up and he's like, I, I can't install the toilet if you don't have the right fixtures. And then you order the fixtures. They show up three weeks later. It's a nightmare, right? It's really amazing. All the precision and performance that we have around synchronizing assets and resources and skills that happens in a factory goes out the window in the real world. <laughs> yep.
And, and what the Internet of Things, the opportunity the Internet of Things gives us is to have, you know, kitchen sinks that say who they are and where they are. And they say, hey, I just cleared customs and I'm, I'm on the truck to your house. Right. And, and then order the right. I, I need these three fixtures to, to attach me to the wall. And this is the skill of plumber I need. I'm, I'm simplifying here, but we finally have the ability to bring some of the precision and productivity that we get in the factory out into the real world. And we've done mapping exercises for clients here at EY where we literally gone in and said, you know, let's look at the cycle time to actually replace the part. We've compared theoretical minimums to actual averages. In some cases, it's 10 to 1, <laughs> 10 to 1 transformation. And, um, uh, and so that that level of transformation is, is, is amazing. I, I'm not sure, some, you know, I, I'm not sure that some industries are ready for that level of productivity because it's, it's a little scary. I mean, what if you really could renovate your bathroom in a week? Yeah, yeah. So, and, and I mean, there are some great stories in the Elon Musk bio about how quickly they were able to, you know, the cycle times of the testing of the new vehicles, you know, which were, happened over the weekend versus the, um, the traditional sort of German manufacturers that would take, uh, you know, a full season, for instance. I mean, so there are, there are glimpses of that in, in, in that, that book, which I think gives us a, a strong sense of what's possible. And he as an individual has, you know, done, um, you know, remarkable breakthroughs in, in two or three different industries. So I think that's a really nice case study you know, for, for what it could could look like. But I suppose my question, Paul, is as you go into the executive suite of some of your clients, what are you looking for? Um, you know, what what are the warnings? What are the what 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 are the warning signs that they that they're not ready, or what are the signs that say, you know, what um, we can work with these folks and help them prepare for this ten x um, change in their economics and their productivity or uh, or their profitability. It's getting much harder to tell. I think when I first went into to clients, you know, 20 years ago when I was an associate, you'd see clients just say, "We don't, we don't think this internet thing is going to be a big deal, right?" There was uh, um, kind of general hostility. Mm-hmm. Now, people are sort of much more circumspect about technology. So what you tend to hear is. Uh, you t- tend to hear a different story, which is, oh, absolutely, uh, we are totally on top of that. You know, we, we have a team, they're working on it, right? We're going to have a product to market in time. And what they, what they miss is that, um, and, and then it becomes much harder because now you have to prove that, yes, you have a team, but no, they're, they're horribly under-resourced. And when they get their product to market, uh, because it was designed by committee, it, it's probably not going to be that compelling. And so it, it, um, it's become harder to identify which companies are, are really committed and which ones aren't. Um, I think, to me, that the marker of serious commitment is uh, two things. First of all, a true portfolio strategy when it comes to innovation, right? The recognition that good times or bad, we have to have some chunk of our, our R&D or our investment budget is, is driven to A, high-risk projects. And B, we understand that not all of it can be internal. We've got to be willing to go and buy companies and, and uh, invest in, in startups. So that's one piece of it. And then the second piece of it is you know it's real when uh, you hit a recession or a bump in the financials and they don't ax the program because those kinds of high-risk, high-reward programs are always the first to be deleted when it's time to rewrite the budget. Interesting, interesting. Now, I mean, the... Um uh, you 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 mentioned Internet of Things. You're also working in blockchain. I think you did did quite a lot of work with IBM in that area while while you were at IBM. And then the third area, which you talked about um, when we spoke earlier on, Paul, was this um, uh, the the new innovation models. So can can we just touch firstly on blockchain and the experience in IBM? Because I think that gives a to the extent to which you can share some details. That that gives a sense of some of the challenges of here's a terribly exciting new technology. Which nonetheless doesn't didn't necessarily fit with the 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 the, the current strat- strategic agenda of the of the leadership team. Can you just say a little bit about about that experience? Yeah. So so blockchains were were really interesting. I, a lot of people came to blockchain because they 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 had a personal engagement with Bitcoin. I came to it because we had um, clients who were asking for uh, uh, old equipment. Right. And we had a client in particular that came and they said, we need some Windows 98 servers. And it was a funny story because we couldn't find any. Uh, but w- when we drilled down to the reason why they wanted such terribly old servers, the answer was they had launched the product uh, back in 1999. And 
uh, uh, more than 10 years later, they still had about 30 or 40,000 customers who were using it and they needed, the, the product was going to fold up without these servers. And it, it led us to start really thinking about, okay, why is it so difficult to create technology that's sustainable over longer periods of time and operates at a very low cost? And at about the same time, we started talking to other companies about what would it cost to start managing large numbers of devices, not hundreds or thousands, but millions. And the answer, at least initially, was a heck of a lot of money. Um, but uh, and, and on the one hand, the sales force was like, wow, this is going to be great. This is going to be a jackpot. <laughs> but when you sat down and, and did the math, what you realized was that if you took something like an LED light bulb, and that's where we're headed. We're headed towards smart connected devices that are as small as light bulbs. Um, the light bulb costs $20. The margin on that light bulb is $5, right? And it's going to last for 20 years. And under the old model, the management services, the IoT management services in the data center to manage that device would not just exceed the margin, they would probably have exceeded the price of the device. That's not a sustainable way to build the Internet of Things. Mm -hmm. And so we, we convened a small research team and a clean sheet of paper and said, if we were going to start from scratch, what would the Internet of Things look like? And, and after a lot of soul searching and many, many bitter arguments about what a smart toaster really should do, we came up with the answer that whatever it does, it's probably going to be powered by a blockchain. Interesting. Yep, yep. <laughs> and, and the implications from a financial point of view on that? Or the the the, the the you know the the life site the life um, lifelong stream of revenues for the for the manufacturer. I mean, how would that work out in that model? So potentially much much lower. I think you know one of the most contrarian conclusions that I personally came to is that the plans that a lot of companies have to sell data developed by IoT devices or to mine it or to build analytics services on on top of it are a pipe dream. And so the problem with managing IoT is not getting more revenue. It's about driving cost out. And I think in, in, this is one of the areas where I have a uh, decidedly contrarian views to most people. I, I am actually not uh, a big believer in big data, and I'm uh, not a, uh, uh, a big believer in, in sort of the advertising or marketing, marketing or data mining driven model of, of, of these businesses. And and so so, can you say a little bit more about that? Because I mean, a lot of a lot of folks, um, you know, a lot of businesses are built. I mean, particularly in agriculture, where I came came from. I mean, the Monsanto acquisition of a big of a data company of Climate Corp was all around that model. And um, you know, what what what's what's led you to the to the counter position on this? So uh, Monsanto's acquisition of a climate company is, is actually an interesting case where you have it's one of the relatively few cases where you have very useful, high value, big data. Mm -hmm. If you look at most enterprises, they're just collecting lots and lots of data. And one of the things that, that people tell them is, oh, go collect all the data and our clever analytics system will find patterns in it for you. I think that's ridiculous. Analytics is hypothesis driven, right? And, and the, the greatest value that comes from analytics is not really big data, it's small data, and it's driven by hypothesis, right? Instead of just sort of collecting all the data. Um, uh, I think collecting all that data, A, it's terrible privacy policy, B, it creates a, a huge honeypot and liability for hackers, but C, it, 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 it distracts people from the issue of thinking carefully about what their customers are doing and developing hypotheses and testing them. So that's number one, which is I think you must be hypothesis driven and, and, and tar targeted in your collection of data. Mm -hmm. The second issue is really has to do with the specific, the special characteristics of markets where the product has a marginal cost of zero. Uh, insights that gen are generated by big data have a marginal production cost of zero, right? I, I can copy that a million times. Mm -hmm. So if you have two players in the market who have identical or similar data to sell, right, and their marginal cost is zero and it's a competitive market, then the market clearing price of that data is zero. Yep, yep. And I think people don't think about sort of the economics of supply and demand, but I like to point out um, we have a lot of cases where data is insightful and it's valuable, but the market price is still zero, right? Think about all those mapping apps, right? Mm -hmm. we, at the end of the day, we, you know, no one's paid for a mapping app on their phone in, you know, seven or eight years. 
Interesting. So, so um, just switching gears a little bit, Paul. For, for, I mean, there's, you know, a lot of listeners for this show are, you know, they, they might characterize them as entrepreneurs themselves as entrepreneurs. So, sitting in large organisations, maybe um, you know, frustrated that their um, that their leadership um, is not necessarily embracing uh, or, or fully investing in, as you say, a portfolio of options and or um, you know, some some high risk projects. What what advice would you give? Camille? I think you've been, you know, you as I said at the intro. I mean, you've you've worked. Um, in a number of different organizational contexts, what advice would you give to the, to these sorts of individuals who are who are wrestling with getting their um, getting their idea listened to, you know, moving forward on a project which might not necessarily be in their formal job description, but nonetheless they feel that this is something that is really relevant for the future of of the industry or their organization, or at least they see see a significant career opportunity by pursuing this. You know, let's say maybe it's an, an Internet of Things um, project, for instance. Yeah, so I, I think uh, may, maybe a couple of thoughts, right? One is don't give up. Um, so I, I think quite a few times, I, I remember very, very early on in my career, I was passionate about mobile data. And um, I, I thought it was the most amazing thing. And I, I bought uh, many, many years ago, there was a company called Metricom. And you could buy a wireless data modem in San Francisco from them. And it had unlimited mobile data at dial-up speeds anywhere in the Bay Area. And I thought it was, I thought it was the most amazing thing. And, uh, I, there wasn't a client that I didn't try to talk to about how mobile data could transform their business. And that was 1996 or 1997 or so. I mean, I thought it was, uh, uh, incredible and really n- nobody listened. Mm-hmm. Right. And I kept trying to kind of push that forward. And, you know, it wasn't until I think, uh, 2014 or so that IBM, you know, did the deal with Apple around mobile devices in the workplace. So there is the risk, especially if you're as nerdy as I am, that you're just way too early. Mm -hmm. And the biggest danger is that you give up on an idea and then it comes of age and you see somebody else like, hey, we appointed Bob over there in charge of our mobile data initiative because, you know, he was he stood up at the right time and you got burned out. So one thing is like, don't don't get burned out on your on these ideas. Right. Stay on top of them. But, you know, play the long game. Mm-hmm. The second thing is try to get really good at articulating the value proposition of this technology. Right. And and keep bringing it back to why it's helpful for the business and always have your elevator pitch ready. Uh, I, I used to t- say to people who work for me, like, I want to help you in your career, uh, but I'm not a mind reader. So you got to keep reminding me of what it is you want to do. And when I see the opportunity and I remember what you want to do, I'm going to be like, hey, that, that's, that's just right for you. And we should put you into it. But you have to, um, managers and leaders can't be mind readers. So you, you got to uh, play the long game. You've got to keep your elevator, elevator pitch on uh, on top of it. And you've got to make sure people know that that's what you want to do. And, uh, you know, uh, I kind of am known as a, you, you got to be comfortably known maybe as a little bit of a strange person. Um, I, I think uh, 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 one of my colleagues from my, one of my colleagues at IBM from the research department said, it's really great that everybody accepts you for who you are. And, <laughs> and I think what he was, what he was talking about is the fact that I, I can be a little bit bizarre. We had we had huge fights over like why we need to build a prototype of a smart toaster, which I lost those battles, but I learned a lot from from having those arguments, and it was a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. And then the related question for that, and I think there's a couple of very good points that you've made there, Paul, for for people, um, and they've been echoed by previous guests actually as it happened. So, um, I mean, you also talk about the, you know the new innovation models that you're working on. I mean, are, are there any to your point around, you know, being sometimes being early is is a is an occupational hazard. But are you? I'm I'm really curious about business models. We had Alex Osterwalder, you know, the author of the business model canvas, business model generation book on the on the on the on the show a few weeks ago, and you know, I I look at Nespresso, which is a, a, a model that he talks about very frequently. And that's basically a Gillette, you know, razor blades and razor model. I, my question, I guess, to you is, are there any, um, and a lot of the big, the big, you know, the big data companies, the Google, the Facebook, I mean, these are basically marketplaces, they're double-sided marketplaces. Any, any are, are, are business models actually evolving or is it just a, a reconfiguration of, of tried and true, you know, tried and tested business models from many, many years ago? What, what's your view on that? I think my view on that is, for the most part, 
business models are not really evolving. There are, it's, it's, I read this article once, it's, it's talked about how there's only like nine types of stories that people tell, right? Uh, and I think it's true for business models as well. However, and this is what's interesting, I, I don't, I really believe that disruption and technological change go hand in hand. Uh, even though people talk a lot about business model innovation, I think for the most part, you can't do business model innovation if there isn't some underlying technology that makes it possible. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the, uh, what is interesting is how technology has made, new, made old business, business models possible in entirely new ways, right? We, we've always had business models that swing between bundled and unbundled goods, between packages and services. But um, thanks to technology and the internet, we can now do c these kinds of things in a way that was just impossible before. Um, if you think about uh, or companies like Uber, they have uh, they've made it possible to deliver what feels like a remarkably consistent integrated taxi service without owning a single cab. Mm -hmm. I don't think it would have been possible before. Vertical integration, large enterprises existed for a reason, which was to internalize all the transaction costs and get everybody on the same page. We now can do the same thing with technology without having to have everybody work for the same enterprise. Um, you setting a, Let's set aside for the moment the question of whether or not that's necessarily always a good thing, at least for the workers. But mm -hmm. it's the technological change that uh, drives business model innovation. And for example, uh, blockchains will enable a whole new wave of business, a whole new wave of innovation, right? Using, mixing up existing business models that we already understand in entirely new ways uh, because they enable trusted, decentralized commerce uh, among parties who don't necessarily know each other. And, and that is revolutionary by itself, right? We've always had integrated companies and trusted relationships because that was the only way to do business. Blockchains allow for decentralized, trustworthy relationships without actually having a single point of contact or a single point of trust in that equation. Yeah, yeah, uh, which is essentially what the you know the, the banking industry going back to whatever the Italian the first the first bank on the planet in Italy. Um, I mean that was what it was all about. It was all about trust, wasn't it? And that's what uh, blockchain enables you to do. Is it's a, I think I'd heard it described as a distributed trust engine. It is, it, it, and and the the Economist headline, you know, calling it the trust machine was was a great example. And it is it is sort of amazing if you think about it, right? Banking crises have been a staple of Western economies since the first bank was created, right? I mean, there's, there's, no, there's no long period of time that doesn't go by without some kind of substantial banking crisis. And so uh, the idea of distributed, sustainable, secure trust is uh, potentially revolutionary in terms of what it enables. And, uh, and then when you apply that Imagine being able to have, I like to call it, I mean, t imagine you had a blockchain for inventory, right? Think about inventory that's as reliable as the, the, the dollars that you have in the bank in terms of accuracy and, and location and so on, right? Imagine we can start to take all of those things and make them as trustworthy and reliable as our bank balance or our credit card. Uh, it, it changes how you think about all of your commercial interactions. Yeah, yeah. So, so Paul, I'm, I'm, I'm curious here because, I mean, you know, you, 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 there seems to be, you know, you're clearly very optimistic about the potential of these new technologies and some of the, some of the, you know, the the fantastic sort of operational improvements and the collapsing of cycle times. But on the other hand, at the beginning of the conversation, you talked about the kind of, you know, this the, the ongoing um, consolidation in industries and, you know, so so where do you land on this? I mean, you know, are you um, are you fundamental? Maybe I'll put it in a different way. I mean, are you? What advice would you give to your kids um, about how they should think about, you know, positioning them? themselves um you know perhaps they're not old enough to, to have these conversations yet but what advice will you give them i mean are you fundamentally positive or negative about how the world is going to shake out and how, how to position oneself in front of that i'm a short-term pessimist and a long-term optimist <laughs> okay. right the truth about transformation is right and and you know whether it's global trade or technological change the fact is every big transformation in industry and technology has winners and losers. And, uh, you know, if you are an auto worker who has 35 years of experience, it will not be easy 
for you to change your life. And I'm a, I'm a pessimist in the short run because I believe that we as a society do a really bad and grossly inadequate job of helping out the people who are on the short end of transformation and globalization. That it, it, it bothers me that we, particularly in the U.S., are a little bit, I think, way too stingy in terms of retraining and assistance. And, and uh, I think that's contributed to some of the anger around globalization, mm-hmm. um, even though in the long run, we've become a, a vastly richer society. So I'm a, a short run pessimist and, and a long run optimist. Um, and I think uh, in the long run, our lives will be transformed. I mean, you know, that the ability to not spend $30,000 on a new car or the, you know, the ability to not spend two hours of your day driving, self-driving cars alone are, are going to be transformational in our society. And, and it's the tip of the iceberg. So for most people, um, it's, a, uh, uh, it, it's, a, it's a transformational opportunity. I, I think, it, you know, I've got two sons for ages mm-hmm. eight and seven. Mm-hmm. Um, and we haven't talked a lot about work. We did have one really interesting conversation with my oldest son about where do hoodies come from, right? How, how, does, how does your little hoodie get all the way from a, a cotton farm uh, somewhere in the world to uh, the Target store near our house? But if I had to have this advice, to give advice to them, and I, I will end up doing that when I'm, I'm sure, because I have an opinion on everything, <laughs> I think I'd tell them, you know, go into a business where interpersonal interaction is at the center of what you do, right? Machines will do a lot of mechanical stuff for us in the future, but they won't replace interpersonal interactions. Um, And those are the things that will create value relationships, your ability to work with people. That's what's going to create value over time and not some particular mechanical skill. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. I'm I'm mindful. I'm thinking of a, um, a future guest we've got coming on who was telling me about a um, that the army are piloting an AI uh, which actually helps um, people deal with post traumatic stress disorder and the the response the, the uptake of offering that service and also the response and the results from that from an AI based um, sort of um, psychotherapist I guess are significantly be- better than the than the traditional model and I, I you know it, that could be to do with trust and it could be to do with you know or mistrust about the traditional model but it's, it's I'm just curious about how AI plays out again you know alongside your idea of the interpersonal you know I suppose maybe what but your point would be that you know th- there will always be the need for those interpersonal relationships alongside AI and, and just make sure you're on the right side of it yeah I think so and I think uh, you know it's it's really hard to know how far artificial intelligence or machine learning will go. I think uh, um, certainly at the moment, I'm tremendously optimistic. The one thing I do worry about is, uh, you know, for years and years and years, we wanted to have machines with which we could have a reasonable conversation, right? Mm-hmm. I still can't ask, uh, when I, I ask my phone, um, you know, is my flight on time? It doesn't know what I'm talking about, even though I have a flight entry in my calendar for later today, right? Uh, This is really basic stuff that if I called my assistant and asked her, she would be able to look that up. Um, So we're getting getting so tantalizingly close, right? The voice recognition has improved tremendously. We're seeing some amazing demonstrations of machine learning. What I worry about a little bit is that Moore's law, the, the underlying ability of computers to crunch ever more numbers ever faster is starting to slow down just when machine learning is getting really interesting. And um, I I do worry a little bit that we're going to, having run this incredible marathon, will we we sort of end up five yards short of the finish line uh, of something that's uh, uh, tremendously useful? Uh, I'm not enough of a computer scientist to know the answer to that, but I, I, I confess to worrying about what will happen as Moore's law slows down because so much of what has gone on, all of this technology disruption, it's underpinned by fundamental changes in, in computing power, first primarily on the hardware side and supported by uh, software uh, as well. Yep, yep, yep. So, Paul, um, let's just wrap this up. I mean, this has been a fantastic conversation. Very grateful. I know it's early for you in the morning. Um, three questions I sent across for you. Um, firstly, what have you changed your mind about recently? Um, 
to me, the thing I've most changed my, my mind about over the last few years is um, it's really human behavior, right? I, I used to be a sort of politically much more of a, a libertarian. I sort of, you know, we, we should all be free to make really bad decisions if we want to. And uh, as I've learned more and more about behavioral economics, I've realized I, I still fundamentally believe that we should be free to make bad decisions. We should be free to smoke and and have you know uh, uh, as much junk food as we want. But uh, it's reasonable and appropriate for things like taxes and other incentives to tilt the playing field in a way that makes doing the things that we know are good um, uh, 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 more much closer to the default option. And at the end of the day, just piles and piles of evidence is starting to show up that that suggests that. In, in some very appropriate respects, human beings are just not great decision makers. Mm, mm. Yeah. Well, I mean, this, um, yeah, and I think we've seen in the politics of uh, the UK and potentially the US, without getting into that, um, that, that, might, that, that there might be lots of evidence at the national level around that point. Um, so, For sure. <laughs> se- second question, um, what do you do to remain creative and innovative? I am a serial hobbyist. So I, I'm, I don't have like I don't have a hobby that I've had for a long time, but I I tend to pick up hobbies and learn them and then put them down. So over the years, I, I've learned to fly. I have an instrument pilot rating. Um, I'm a certified, although lapsed, emergency medical technician. Um, I built a smart home, uh, and I'm currently uh, learning how to uh, do triathlons and, and have finished a half Ironman and I've got a full Ironman on the agenda for next year. And Every time I pick up one of these hobbies, I, I come away from it learning all kinds of great insights, right? Uh, you know, I, I learned a huge amount about process and technology, learning to fly. I mean, every day we get into these like basically aluminum gasoline cans <laughs> powered by unbelievably unreliable equipment, namely human beings. And it's the single most safest form of transportation on the planet. And in order to get that way, you have to get astonishingly good at thinking about redundancy, around process control. I learned a ton from learning to fly, and it's, it's influenced my thinking about business process since then. Triathlons have completely reshaped my thoughts about wearables and, and human metrics, um, which for all the data I capture on my smart sensors and so on have been utterly useless in improving my training. (laughs) And I've realized that if I didn't have any of these smart devices, I would be doing the same thing. So every time I pick up one of these serial hobbies, these new hobbies, I learn something new about, about the world. And I I realized I I like the part of learning and coming up the learning curve much more than I like the part about sticking around for another 5,000 hours uh, of practice to become a real expert. Right. Right. Yeah. But having said that, I mean, a half Ironman and then, uh, you know, with an Ironman on the calendar, I mean, that's not um, that's not fiddling around with it. That's getting quite serious. So maybe you do yourself a little bit of an injustice there. (laughs) Uh, Maybe. I hope so. My goals are not to win. They're just to finish. And I had a great I had a really good conversation with my kids who are sort of like all little boys, hyper competitive. And we talked about why would you do something where you're going to place 143rd? (laughs) Yeah. Well, yeah. I'm. Sh- and well, I'll f- have to follow you on. I guess you're on Strava, are you, Paul? I am. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, and follow, the Garmin follow- as well. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. Well, I'll follow you on that. Final question: um, To what would you attribute your success in life? I mean, are there any specific skills, habits, or mindsets that you've kind of mastered that you you really think have had a significant impact? Well, I, I would say you know, number one, good luck. Right. I, I am insanely fortunate. Uh, and probably number two, the generosity of others. I mean, I, every time I think about like, to what would I attribute my success? The answer is I've been incredibly lucky, uh, incredibly fortunate, and other people have been amazingly kind to me. I have been given incredible opportunities. And it, it starts with that. And I, I try to remind myself that what separates me from a lot of people who've been less successful is good luck mm-hmm. and not more than that. Now, somehow I'd like, I try to also keep in mind, like I am, ridiculously hard worker. And I, I don't know, I don't know why. Uh, one of the things that's very strange is my parents never applied pressure. They never said, you've got to do this. You've got to do that. I, I remember, you know, coming, um, home and, and opening the mail and, and getting a really fantastic score on the SAP. And my, my mother asked, is that good? Because she didn't know and that nobody had been telling me what to do. So I, somehow I'm very driven for reasons I, I can't say. And I, I think, 
a lot of that hard work has, has paid off, uh, uh, hard work and, and curiosity. But I, I always come back to, I have received incredible good fortune and it is my responsibility to figure out how I deliver that first to my children and then secondly to other people. Yep, yep. Where, where can people get in touch with you, Paul? Uh, email or Twitter. So I'm at P Brody on Twitter. Uh, uh, my email is paul.brody at ey.com. And you can also find me on LinkedIn. Uh, I will confess, I am not uh, as quick as I would like to be just given the volume of email, but I really do try to get to all of it. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, we'll put all that in the show notes. Um, I mean, it's been great having you on the show. Really do appreciate it. I'm, I'm sure the audience enjoyed it as much as I did. And thanks very much for your time today, Paul. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm, I'm flattered to be invited to the show. I, I've listened to some of the other podcasts and read the transcripts. I, I feel I'm in very, very good company. Well, I, I, th I think I'm, I'm very lucky that I'm able to attract people like you onto the show because it is, um, you know, it's, it's, it's great to be able to put some of this stuff out. And the, the message that you bring is, 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 a, is a very, very relevant one. So, you know, thank you for your time. Thank you so much and uh, have a terrific week. Great. Thanks, Paul. Bye. Bye-bye. Mark, again, great conversation. I mean, the two big opportunities Paul sees around underutilized assets and around cycle time compression, which, as he said, is going to impact many areas of our lives. And that's already beginning to happen. Good advice around the being resilient, being uh, always prepared, even though the timing might not be right. And of course, you know, the, the concept of the boomerang career, which I love, which um, is reassuring for those who've gone out of large organizations into more entrepreneurial ventures, as indeed Paul did, and now found, him, found his way back into a large organization in a bigger role, and clearly at the, at the center of a number of really interesting um, trends in, in business. So plenty to go for there. Of course, that's knowledge. It's, it's knowledge is, isn't power, it's only potential power. So I urge you to go onto the, onto the site, download some of our resources, um, in particular, join thousands of other business leaders to um, access the resources that have the potential to transform your organization. Um, you can get that on our website, www.innovationecosystem.com. That's all one word. And until next week, have a great week. Mm -hmm.